When historians look back at the 21st century, they will see the 2008 financial crash as one of the most important events of the past two decades. This was the largest economic crisis since the Great Depression of the 1930s, and this Great Recession is something we're still living with today. Not only did the 2008 crash affect geopolitics and the global economy, but it also led to regulations. And in response to those new reforms, Western government officials insisted that they had fixed the problem. The former chair of the U.S. Central Bank, the Federal Reserve, Janet Yellen, claimed confidently in 2017 that she did not expect to see a new financial crisis in our lifetimes. Well, today, Janet Yellen is the U.S. Secretary of the Treasury overseeing U.S. fiscal policy, and we are seeing a new crisis. This March, three U.S. banks collapsed in the span of one week. The New York-based Signature Bank, which had lended a lot to cryptocurrency companies, went down in the third largest bank collapse in U.S. history. A few days before that, the California-based Silicon Valley Bank collapsed in the second biggest bank crash in U.S. history, and it was the biggest collapse since the 2008 Great Recession. In response to the Great Depression of the 1930s, the Franklin Delano Roosevelt administration passed the New Deal, these progressive reforms, and one of them created a U.S. government-owned company called the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, the FDIC. For banks in the U.S. that are backed by the FDIC, their deposits are insured by the U.S. government up to $250,000. That means that if you have a bank account at one of the FDIC-insured banks, if you have under $250,000 in your bank account and the bank collapses, the U.S. government will pay you that money. However, this March, the U.S. government violated its own policies by bailing out all of the depositors at Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank, despite the fact that 93% of the deposits at Silicon Valley Bank and 90% of the deposits at Signature Bank were above the $250,000 insured FDIC limit. In fact, according to the investment website Investec, the average deposit account at Silicon Valley Bank had around $5 million in it, which is 20 times the U.S. government insured limit. And that's not all. The 10 largest accounts at Silicon Valley Bank combined had $13.3 billion. So those among those top 10 accounts, on average, each of them had 1.3 billion dollars in it. These are large companies and billionaires who are holding their wealth in Silicon Valley Bank, despite the fact that they knew that anything over $250,000 was not insured by the U.S. government. And yet, when the bank collapsed, the U.S. government paid them. It made the depositors whole. They didn't have to take a haircut. They didn't lose a single cent of their money. What I'm going to talk about today is how this U.S. government bailout of the rich, of billionaires, of large companies exposes the deep corruption in the U.S. political system. At, over at geopoliticaleconomy.com, I have an article which includes all of the links to the sources that I'll be discussing today. Now, back in March, I did another report, which I'll also link to in the description below, which provided more information about this scandal with three U.S. banks collapsing in just one week. In that report, I showed how the U.S. Federal Reserve printed $300 billion in one week in order to stabilize the banking system. This is a policy that the U.S. government would never carry out to bail out, for instance, mortgage holders who lost their homes in the 2008 financial crash. It would never be used to bail out average working people, but instead billionaires and large corporations were bailed out by the U.S. government. Since I published that previous report, we have more and more information coming out showing just how scandalous this U.S. government bailout is. On March 28th, the U.S. Senate Committee on Banking, Housing, and Urban Affairs held a hearing looking at the bank failures. 
That hearing featured several top U.S. officials, including Martin Grunberg, who is the chairman of the FDIC. Grunberg submitted written testimony for the Senate Bank Committee, in which he revealed that the 10 largest deposit accounts at Silicon Valley Bank together had $3.3 billion in them. The FDIC has something called the Deposit Insurance Fund, the DIF, which is basically a pool of money that it uses to bail out the banks in times of crisis, like this collapse in March. And in his written testimony, Grunberg estimated that 18 billion of that $20 billion used to bail out the banks went to covering the costs of uninsured deposits at Silicon Valley Bank. That is 88% with an additional $1.6 billion paid to bail out the uninsured deposits at Signature Bank. So $13 billion of the $18 billion that was used to pay the uninsured deposits at Silicon Valley Bank went directly to the 10 biggest bank accounts, which were combined $13.3 billion. We are talking about a bailout of big corporations and billionaires. These are not small businesses. This directly contradicts the narrative that we were told when the U.S. government bailed out these uninsured depositors that it was important to save small businesses and mom and pop shops. That's not true. Over half of the loans given out by Silicon Valley Bank, 56%, went to private equity firms and venture capital firms. That's why the finance website Wall Street on Parade described Silicon Valley Bank as a Wall Street IPO pipeline in drag as a federally insured bank. At Signature Bank, it was a very similar story. Around 20% of the bank's deposits were held by cryptocurrency companies. These are not small mom and pop businesses. The most clear example of how the US government bailout was a bailout of billionaires and the rich is the fact that the right wing billionaire oligarch, Peter Thiel, had $50 million in a personal bank account in Silicon Valley Bank, and he was unable to withdraw that money when the bank went under. And yet every penny of his personal account was paid to him through this U.S. government bailout. I should also point out the irony that Peter Thiel was one of the Silicon Valley oligarchs who initiated the bank run on Silicon Valley Bank in the first place, which is what led it to collapse. But that's a subject for another episode. Now, the Senate Bank Committee hearing that was held on March 28th was chaired by the Ohio Democratic Senator Sherrod Brown. And of course, the Democratic Party in general is very hawkish and very imperialist. But in terms of the party, he is a relatively progressive Democrat, not really in foreign policy because almost none of them are, but at least on economic policy. He's much more critical of big corporations and banks. And in this hearing, he said he understands why Americans are angry and disgusted at this bailout of the rich. So I understand why Americans are angry, even disgusted at how quickly the government mobilized when a bunch of elites in California were demanding it. People have a pretty good sense of whose problems get taken more seriously than others in this town. Senator Sherrod Brown pointed out that before it collapsed, Silicon Valley Bank went nearly a year without having a chief financial risk officer. He also pointed out that Signature Bank, which collapsed in the same week, had multiple bank accounts that were under the name of Sam Bankman Freed, the fraudster who oversaw the collapse of the cryptocurrency exchange FTX. Really though, it comes down to more basic concepts, hubris, entitlement, greed. And always, always, always with big paydays at the end at the, for the executives at the top. The CEO's own pay was tied directly to the growth of SVB. At SVB, executive bonuses were pegged to return on equity. So they took more risk by buying assets with higher yields to make higher profits. When those investments started to lose money, they didn't back down. It won't surprise anyone that Silicon Valley Bank went nearly a year without a chief risk officer. Venture capitalists fueled the bank's growth by forcing the companies they invested in and advised to keep their money at Silicon Bank. And then those same VCs turned around and sparked the bank run by telling the companies to pull their money out, creating more chaos, more panic. 
Signature, Signature Bank found itself in the middle of Sam Bankman Freed's crime spree at the crypto exchange FTX. The bank let him open multiple accounts. They ignored red flag after red flag. In this hearing, Senator Brown pointed out that this is part of a classic trope we see where economic elites in the U.S. engage in risky behavior and then they fail and they're bailed out by the government. It's all just a variation of the same theme, the same root cause of most of our economic problems. Wealthy elites do anything, anything to make a quick profit and pocket the rewards. And when their risky behavior leads to catastrophic failures, they turn to the government. They turn to the government asking for help, expecting workers and taxpayers to pay the price. And too often workers do. He also pointed out the hypocrisy of billionaire oligarchs in Silicon Valley demanding a U.S. government bailout after years of using right-wing libertarian rhetoric and criticizing the government in the very rare occasions when it provides welfare and social support for poor people and unemployed people. And yet now, they're the ones who are demanding that they get billions of dollars in a bailout. Of course, we have to prevent systemic threats to the economy, but corporate trade deals are a systemic threat to towns like I grew up in in Mansfield, Ohio, and across the industrial Midwest. So it's a Wall Street business model that rewards short-term profits over investments and innovation in workers. And those threats are not only toler tolerated, they've been actively pushed by the same crowd that this month clamored for the government to save them. Just as there are no atheists in foxholes, it appears that when there is a bank crash, there are no libertarians in the Silicon Valley. I hope that from now on, those who have no problem with government intervention to protect their own livelihoods will think a little bit harder about what their warped version of the free market has done to workers in Ohio. It is very refreshing to hear comments like that from U.S. Congress people. However, there's a big asterisk here. The U.S. Congress bears responsibility for this crisis, and it exposes the deep corruption in the U.S. political system. To understand this, we have to go back to 2010 in the wake of the Great Recession, the 2008 financial crash. In 2010, the U.S. Congress passed the Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act. This ensured new regulations of the banking system aiming at preventing a new financial crisis from happening. However, those reforms did not last very long because in 2018, just eight years later, the U.S. Congress repealed those regulations on medium-sized banks that had assets between $50 billion and $250 billion. And they did so in response to lobbying by the banks themselves. And can you guess what was one of the banks that lobbied Congress successfully to lift regulations? You guessed it, Silicon Valley Bank. The New York Times reported on this back in May 2018, and it noted that the rollback of the Dodd-Frank regulations was, quote, a rare demonstration of bipartisanship. Now, at this moment, Donald Trump was the president and the Republicans controlled the government. However, although it was led by the Republicans, it did have bipartisan support from neoliberal Democrats. President Trump himself had lobbied against the Dodd-Frank regulations of Wall Street and Trump promised, quote, to do a big number on Dodd-Frank. In 2018, when, this, when the regulations were lifted, the New York Times described this as a substantial watering down of the rules governing the banking system. And they said the legislation will leave fewer than 10 big banks in the United States subject to stricter federal oversight freeing thousands of banks with less than $250 billion in assets from a post-crisis crackdown. And one of those banks that had the regulations lifted was Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank. In the Senate Bank Committee hearing that was held this March 28th, several Democrats pointed out that it was Donald Trump who signed that bill into law, lifting the regulations on these banks that collapsed. In 2018, Congress passed a bill which was signed into law by President Trump that relaxed re uh, regulation for institutions like Silicon Valley Bank. Uh, 
And yes, it is true that Trump bears responsibility. However, what they're not mentioning is many members of their party, the Democrats, also voted in support of lifting these regulations. It was a clear example of bipartisan corruption. And today we see that corruption is alive and well in both parties, Republicans and Democrats. NBC News reported that neoliberal Senate Democrats are joining Republicans in resisting new calls for regulations after the collapse of SVB. NBC News wrote, quote, moderate Senate Democrats who voted to loosen regulations on mid-sized banks in 2018 are standing by their votes in the wake of Silicon Valley's bank collapse, joining Republicans in resisting enhanced scrutiny for financial institutions. Among the right-wing Democrats who refuse to support more regulations of the banks is Tim Kaine. Tim Kaine was Hillary Clinton's vice presidential candidate when she ran for president in 2016. So this says everything about the leadership of the Democratic Party. But that's not the only example of the systemic corruption in U.S. Congress. An even more outrageous example of this blatant corruption is the namesake of the Dodd-Frank Act. That was the act passed in 2010 that implemented regulation of the banks. It was called Dodd-Frank because one of the main sponsors of the bill was the former congressman Barney Frank. After Barney Frank left Congress, he was given a position on the board of Signature Bank, precisely the bank that collapsed in March, the bank that had 20% of its deposits held by cryptocurrency companies. And like Silicon Valley Bank, many of its customers were off also venture capital firms and private equity firms. The Financial Times interviewed Barney Frank in March after the collapse of Signature Bank, and he defended his position on the board saying, quote, I need to make money. So he didn't even have an excuse. He said, they were paying me money. The Financial Times estimated that Barney Frank made $2 million just by sitting on the board of the bank, which is basically no work. The Financial Times wrote that he has no regrets in joining Signature's board. And they note that another example of corruption, Frank never officially registered as a lobbyist, but he publicly argued that the Dodd-Frank legislation that he helped create its threshold of $50 billion for regulation of banks was too low. And he called for that to be lifted. And in 2018, it was lifted. So here we have an example of the former Congress members whose names are literally on the laws passed to regulate the banks, calling for the banks to have that regulation lifted and then sitting on the boards of those banks getting paid millions of dollars. This is the definition of corruption. And yet it's so systemic. It's so common in the United States. Basically, it's made invisible. Another clear example of the structural corruption in the U.S. political system can be seen in regulatory capture. That is the regulators in the U.S. government who are supposed to be regulating the big banks and corporations are in, in fact in cahoots with the big banks and corporations and serving their interests. And in the Senate Bank Committee hearing that was held on March 28th, the Senator Elizabeth Warren raised this issue. Now, as I said earlier, when it comes to the Democratic Party, there are basically very few or really no Democrats who are willing to challenge the U.S. war machine and U.S. imperialism. So when it comes to foreign policy, Elizabeth Warren is awful. When it comes to economic policy, she is more progressive and has spoken out about this corruption, calling for more regulation. And in this bank committee hearing, Elizabeth Warren grilled the chair of the FDIC, Martin Grunberg, calling out his predecessor for working hand in glove with the banks to lift the regulation of them. Chairman Grunberg, let me turn to you. Once the Fed began torching rule after rule in 2018 for big banks, the FDIC, under your predecessor, 
joined in on the fun and also started weakening FDIC rules across the board. Capital and liquidity uh, requirements, stress tests, you name it. In fact, your predecessor explicitly told these banks that if FDIC bank examiners were asking too many questions, that they should, quote, let us know, end quote. Now, there's a banking regulator who makes it clear that she is there to serve the big banks instead of the American public. Chairman Gruenberg, will you commit to using your authority to undo the rollbacks that your predecessor initiated and to strengthen the rules and supervision for banks with greater than $100 billion in assets? Senators, I think you know I was a member of the board at that time and, and voted against those measures. And I certainly think it's appropriate for us to go back and review uh, those uh, actions in light of the recent episode uh, and, and consider what changes should well, be Well, I have to say, review sounds a little wishy here. You didn't think they were good rules to begin with. Uh, my views haven't changed, Senator. All right. So you still think they were a bad idea? I do. Got it. In her comments there, Elizabeth Warren was referencing a 2018 Wall Street Journal article titled, Banks Get Kinder, Gentler, Gentler Treatment Under Trump. And it shows how the Trump administration whittled back a lot of these regulations. And here is another clear example of corruption. The article noted that two top U.S. government officials appointed by Trump spent several months touring the country visiting bank examiners in regional offices and asking them to adopt a less aggressive tone when flagging risky practices and pressing firms to change their behavior. In other words, what that means is that the bosses of the regulators were going around the US and telling the regulators to not regulate the banks or at least to be much softer in the regulation of the banks. And the Wall Street Journal specifically singled out two Trump appointed top US government officials the vice chair, chair of supervision for the Federal Reserve, Randall Quarles, and the FDIC chairwoman, Jelena McWilliams. She is the predecessor to the current chairman, Martin Grunberg, the one who was grilled by Elizabeth Warren in the Senate Bank Committee hearing. And the Wall Street Journal said that these top U.S. government officials were trying to reshape regulators' relationship with banks which officials have said was too contentious following the financial crisis. That is to say that they want to be friends with the banks, which they're supposed to be regulating. In a great foreshadowing of the March 2023 banking crash, the Wall Street Journal noted that critics say friendlier examiners could blunt the effect of post-crisis rules, giving banks more freedom to engage in riskier practices. And it quoted a professor of business and formal Fed lawyer who said, we have a constant cycle of crisis, regulation, deregulation, and then crisis again. It's in that deregulatory time period that risks start to build. And that is exactly what happened. We had the 2008 crisis, we had regulation in 2010, and then we had deregulation in 2018, leading up to crisis in March of 2023. The Wall Street Journal quoted a bank lobbyist who said that the regulators are being much more friendly with the banks. And it quoted the former chair of the FDIC, Mick Williams, who said she told the banks that if you feel the regulators are regulating too much, let us know. That was what Elizabeth Warren quoted. Another part of this article, which again was foreshadowing of the bank crash we saw this March, was this line that the Wall Street Journal wrote in 2018, quote, the Fed plans to remove a key liquidity requirement for mid-sized banks with $100 billion to $250 billion in assets, which is, by the way, exactly the size of Silicon Valley Bank. Now, Yale University's School of Management has a program on financial stability, and they published a report in the wake of the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank that acknowledges how these deregulations of mid-sized banks like SVB helped lay the groundwork for the crisis that we saw this March. I want to read some of the main points of this report from Yale University. They noted that in 2018, 
U.S. bank regulators following the law passed in Congress ruled that banks with between $50 billion and $250 billion in assets would no longer be subject to the liquidity coverage ratio, that's the LCR, and other regulations that they applied to the biggest banks. And the biggest banks in the U.S. are known as systemically important banks. Now, the liquidity coverage ratio requires banks to hold a sufficient number of high quality liquid assets to manage expected net cash outflows. That is to say that if there is a, a bank run like we saw on Silicon Valley Bank, and if the bank needs to pay lots of depositors, it needs to have what's called high quality liquid assets. Liquid means that they can immediately sell it and get cash for it. So under the original 2014 version of the regulation, banks with $250 billion in assets or $10 billion in foreign exposures had to maintain their liquidity coverage ratio above 100%. According to the previous rules, Silicon Valley Bank would have been subject to that ratio because its foreign exposures met the threshold. The Yale University uh, researchers reviewed SVB's public financials and concluded that its liquidity coverage ratio would have been only 75% at the end of 2022, substantially below the previous threshold of over 100%. And they say, this result should, suggests that the 2019 tailoring rule, that is the deregulation of medium-sized banks following the 2018 passage of the law, that the, they say that, that this deregulation was complicit in the run and failure at Silicon Valley Bank. That is to say that one of the main factors for the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank and the run on it was because it was no longer abiding by the 100% liquidity coverage ratio that the previous regulations had mandated, but that were lifted. To be fair though, the deregulation was not the only factor. This Yale University study pointed out that even under the existing regulatory framework that is with the large deregulation, super, Silicon Valley Bank's supervisors should have identified the liquidity risks the company faced due to its high concentration to and run-inducing dependence on a specific type of corporate depositor. Another very significant factor in the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank was that it had invested a lot in long-term securities. And as the Federal Reserve in the past year has significantly raised interest rates, the value of the U.S. Treasury bonds that Silicon Valley Bank had invested in significantly decreased. The wealth management website Schroeder's pointed out that Silicon Valley Bank was not a typical bank. Its business model was focused on the venture capital ecosystem with a high concentration of customers in the tech startup space, which already made it very speculative and already made it very unstable. Furthermore, the most significant factor is that rather than matching deposits with loans, Silicon Valley Bank instead largely invested in long dated and fixed rate government bonds. And as interest rates increased, the value of those assets declined. And at Silicon Valley Bank, 56% of its assets were held in securities. You can compare that, for instance, to Bank of America, where only 28% of its assets are held in securities. So it is not as exposed to the problems of increasing interest rates. That point is very important. I'm gonna come back to it later on toward the end of this analysis. But the main point to take away that I wanna stress here is that one of the main reasons for the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank is the deregulation of medium-sized banks in 2018 and 2019 by Congress after banks like Silicon Valley Bank lobbied Congress and the liquidity requirements that those banks had were removed. So if Silicon Valley Bank had been under those heavier regulations and those liquidity requirements, and there was someone like a chief financial risk officer, which there had not been for a year, looking at the fact that it had these long-term securities that were losing value because of rising interest rates, it is quite probable that 
Silicon Valley Bank would not have collapsed. It would have changed its investment strategy like other bigger banks that are more heavily regulated did actually do. Now, in response to the U.S. government bailout of these billionaires and big corporations and their deposits at Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank, U.S. President Joe Biden claims that taxpayers were not bearing the cost of this bailout. No losses will be, and I'm, this is an important point, no losses will be borne by the taxpayers. Let me repeat that. No losses will be borne by the taxpayers. Instead, the money will come from the fees that banks pay into the deposit insurance fund. Because of the actions of that, because of the actions that our regulators have already taken, every American should feel confident that their deposits will be there if and when they need them. These statements are deeply misleading. Technically, on paper, they're true. However, at the end of the day, it is taxpayers, it's average working class people who are going to bear the cost of this. And let me explain why. The FDIC, which bailed out the deposits, used money that it has in its deposit insurance fund, the DIF. The DIF is filled through fees that the entire banking system pays, not only SVB and Signature Bank, all of the banks that are insured by the FDIC, depending on their size, depending on how risky they are, they have to pay what are essentially taxes to the FDIC, which goes into the deposit insurance fund. And before the crash, the deposit insurance fund was around $120 billion. Now, that money ultimately comes from customers at the banks. Why do I say that? Because it's not like the banks are losing money. In fact, the banks are making record profits. Data from the FDIC itself shows that the US banking system is making profits that are significantly higher than they were even in 2008 on the eve of the financial crash. In 2022, the US banking system made $263 billion in net income. In 2021, it made $279 billion in net income. And net income is even larger than gross profits because the net income of a company subtracts the taxes and the other expenses from the gross profits. So when we're talking about 260 or 270 billion dollars in net income per year that is after paying taxes and other expenses these banks are making so much money and only a small fraction of that goes into the taxes they pay essentially what are the fees or taxes to the fdic for the deposit insurance fund why do i mention that because the point is that the money used to bail out these banks came from fees that the banks pay, and those fees are ultimately paid by the customers at the banks, by actual working class people who are struggling to make ends meet. And the clearest example of this can be seen in a report that was published by Bloomberg in 2022, which is called The Myth of Free Checking Costs Consumers Over $8 Billion Per Year. It shows how banks in the United States make billions and billions of dollars charging their poor and working class customers overdraft fees. These are fees on poor people. Overdraft fees are fees on people who literally don't have any money. That's the whole point. An overdraft fee is what the bank charges a customer when the amount in their account is lower than the minimum, which in many cases is negative. So this is a fee, the burden of which is borne by poor people. And according to Bloomberg, in 2008, on the eve of the financial crash, overdraft and related fees brought in Wall Street $34 billion per year. Just in 2021, JP Morgan made $1.21 billion from overdraft fees. Bank of America made $1.14 billion. Wells Fargo made $1.4 billion. Even smaller banks like Fifth Third, PNC, regional banks, USAA, even they made hundreds of millions of dollars in overdraft fees. Bloomberg wrote, quote, many Americans enjoy free checking accounts on the backs of the fees paid by poor people. Customers who pay overdraft fees again and again, who typically have no more than a few hundred dollars in the bank, 
are responsible for over half the profits from mass market consumer checking accounts at biggest U.S. lenders. So when Biden or other U.S. officials say this bailout didn't use taxpayer money, well, it's technically true because it's not direct taxpayer money. But at the end of the day, it is still money coming from taxpayers unless the banks are willing to give up their profits, their record profits. And of course, they refuse to do that. I should also point out that workers and average people end up paying the cost in general of all of these issues when big banks are bailed out by the U.S. government through the form of inflation. Because the Federal Reserve is always more than happy to print hundreds of billions of dollars or even trillions of dollars to bail out the banks when they're in crisis. And all that does is it fuels asset price inflation, which fuels the price of households, of real estate, of the wealthy who own real estate because many working class people can't afford real estate, which means that their rent prices go up. They have to pay more and more in rent every year. So working class people end up bearing the cost of these inflationary policies, including 15 years of quantitative easing that the Federal Reserve pursued after the 2008 financial crash to have an imaginary, a fake recovery. There was never an actual recovery because the recovery was in what economist Michael Hudson refers to as the fire sector, finance, insurance, and real estate. It was not an actual recovery for poor and working people. It was a recovery that was basically a big bubble of asset price inflation. And now that the Federal Reserve is raising interest rates, we see that that asset price inflation bubble is being popped and one of the consequences of that bubble being popped is the bank crisis that we see today. Now, I'm going to conclude this episode today looking at another report from Wall Street on Parade. This is a very important resource that anyone who's interested in understanding what's actually happening with the deep corruption systemically in the U.S. financial system. I highly recommend checking out their invaluable reporting. Over at that website, the financial analysts Pam Martins and Russ Martins warned that the banking crisis is far from over. And in their article, they looked at a graph that was included in the written testimony for the bank committee hearing in the Senate on March 28th. And this is a graph that comes from the FDIC, from its chair, Martin Grunberg. And it shows the losses on investment securities at U.S. banks from 2008. And the graph shows that at, at the peak of the worst moment of the Great Recession in 2008, U.S. banks lost around $75 billion in their investment securities. However, today, in the past year, and even before the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank, starting in 2022, when the Federal Reserve began in March raising interest rates, since then, U.S. banks have been bleeding the value on their investment securities. The graph shows that by quarter, U.S. banks were losing around $250 billion and up to $675 billion in their investment securities. And why is that? It's because as the Federal Reserve raises interest rates, long-term securities like treasury bonds drop in value. They become less valuable because investors are looking for higher interest-bearing securities. So what that means is that many of these banks are hemorrhaging money in the value of their assets. Wall Street on Parade explained this. They, they wrote, you are no doubt asking yourself how 2008 could have been the worst financial crisis since the Great Depression if banks had less than $75 billion in unrealized losses on their investment securities. That's because the mega banks on Wall Street were highly interconnected, understood how highly leveraged each one was, and backed away from extending credit as the panic started to spread. In his written testimony for the Senate Bank Committee hearing, the FDIC chair acknowledged this. He, he explained that a key weakness in the banking industry is elevated levels of unrealized losses on investment securities due to rapid increases in market interest rates. So that is to say, 
as the Federal Reserve raises the federal funds rate, the interest rates, the long-term investment securities like treasury bonds held by these banks continue to decrease in value. So banks are hemorrhaging more in the value of their assets than they were even at the peak of the 2008 financial crash. This is the asset price inflation bubble being popped by the Federal Reserve after it inflated it for 15 years. And economist Michael Hudson said that very clearly in an interview that I did with him recently about the collapse of these banks. I will link to that in the description below. Michael Hudson said that what's happening to Silicon Valley Bank could potentially happen to the entire economy because the so-called recovery after the 2008 financial crisis was not a real recovery based on economic production and high quality economic growth. It was based on asset price inflation to increase the value of the capitalist class's investments in securities, in real estate. And now here we are today and the Federal Reserve is faced with either fighting consumer price index inflation, potentially collapsing the economy and bursting that bubble or continuing with the kind of stagflation we saw in the 1970s, where there is both high rates of consumer price index inflation and stagnation in the economy. I'm going to conclude this video here with those very important words of wisdom from Michael Hudson. That is uh, the what is uh squeezing the entire financial sector right now. So just as uh, the quantitative easing was uh, uh, flooding the economy with, uh, with enough credit to inflate asset prices for real estate stocks and bonds, the uh, tightening of credit lowered uh, the access, uh, asset prices for bonds, certainly, for real estate too. So the problem is that uh, the 2009 crisis wasn't a systemic crisis. But now uh, the rising uh, interest rates have created a systemic crisis because uh, the banks, uh, by the Federal Reserve, by saving the banks uh, uh, balance sheets, by uh, inflating uh, the prices for uh, capital assets, by saving the wealthiest 10% of the economy from losing uh, any of their money, by solving that problem, they've uh, boxed themselves into a corner. They cannot let interest rates rise without making the entire economy look like Silicon Valley Bank. So with that, I'm going to wrap up my analysis today. Over at geopoliticaleconomy.com, you can find an article that has links to all of the sources that I discussed today in this analysis. I have that article linked in the description below. If you like the work that we do here at Geopolitical Economy Report, please consider supporting us. You can go to geopoliticaleconomy.com slash support, or you can become a patron over at patreon.com slash geopoliticaleconomy. We are completely independent. We have no institutional support. We rely entirely on small donations from viewers and listeners like you. And by the way, if you're watching or listening on whatever platform it is, please subscribe to help the algorithm, to help promote this reporting that we do. I'm Ben Norton. I will see you all next time. Thanks a lot.